Chitun. Good morning. How are you doing? Thank you for inviting me to come to speak here in Tehran. I'm uh, very honored to speak about this next subject. I hope some of you were in my lecture yesterday. It will be um, sort of a part two of it. Yesterday we focused on design and aesthetics, something you heard Jamal give a little bit of talk on in terms of the nose. Tonight, today we're going to talk about really, really how to communicate to a patient because now today my practice is as much about fillers as fat grafting because those are two methods to help build a face beautifully. And if you don't understand how to deliver that to a patient in terms of what would be the benefits, a patient won't understand it and there can be problems. I think the era of great filling for me began about three or four years ago, October 2010, when really the advent of the micro cannula has completely changed my practice in terms of high volume filling. And I just evolved that technique to understand how to do this so much better over time. Let's talk today about three different models of communicating. And if these work for you, great. And if they don't, that's fine too. This is a way that I would like to make it easy for patients to understand this. And I think patient communication is everything. And you have to tell the patient this beforehand, because if you don't, I always say the education is told before the procedure and excuses, but Dr. Lamb, I didn't know, I, didn't th I thought fat grafting was supposed to do this. I, th I thought fillers were supposed to do that. So the first thing I want to talk about is the model of a glass of water emptying. Because that, to me, is a very easy concept to explain to a patient about how aging is in terms of volume loss. So I say that in youth, and you heard this in ye uh, yesterday's talk, sometimes you're too full in your early 20s. So a lot of women, when I ask them when they thought they looked the best, they tell me early 30s, not necessarily 18 or 20. There's a lot of baby fat, because what baby fat is essentially is a linear loss of fat from birth until death. And what we do is to restore it back to an ideal. The yellow lines show you that if you're much older, I'm going to put more volume in. And if you're a little less, or let's say more youthful, I'm going to put less volume in. But then the question is how permanent this is. If you're dealing with fat graftings or an alternative such as permanent fillers, for example, Artifil, is it permanent? Yes and no. I mean, it is permanent, but it's not going to stop aging. So the pink lines show you that that glass of water is continued to empty even though what I'm giving you may be durable and permanent. Just as much as if I do a hair transplant on you, what I give you is mostly permanent. You may lose a few of those, but in general, you're going to continue to lose hair. So that's important. So how do I understand the construct of fat grafting versus fillers if, for example, I'm going to use fat? I use the 80-20 rule, which is the idea that fat will deliver about 80% of what I want and fillers are necessary for me to top off my fat. Why? Fat is not perfect. It doesn't have 100% take. And anytime you show a patient to an idealistic result, you can show them almost to an idealistic result with fillers. Because you can push a filler all the way to a person who looks almost near flawless, granted if they have good skin or they don't have a saggy jowl. But fat, by itself, you can't get that level of perfection every single time. So I tell my patients there's variability in the fat and I need fillers to get it closer to perfection. When we talk about the idea of the face like a bed, which will be my second model, I'll go into more details about the limitations of fat as well as the benefits and I think it's going to become clearer there. So who's a good candidate for fat versus fillers? Well, what I say is that if you're less than 40, and this is not absolute, Fillers can be very helpful because you may not need as much, especially if you don't have a lot of sun damage. So I can go there and just put a few syringes of fillers and you can look great. If you're over 40, oftentimes there's enough volume loss, especially if you're fair skin, such as maybe from the you know, British Isles where there's maybe more sun damage. If you move, for example, to Australia, the fair skin person with a lot of sun damage may need a fat graft at 35. So these are not absolute numbers. Why do fat in someone over 40? Well, we're going to go more into detail, but for me, one of the big things is cost because I say fat is free. You can put as much volume as you want, and especially when someone's got a mid-facial absence, especially in the buccal area particularly. It will take me syringe after syringe. I like this word. I heard it in a, a lecture before, like a sinkhole, and I find that way with fillers. If I put in the buccal area, I keep on filling. I need more and more syringes. With fat, I can go in there and put 5 cc, 6 cc's on one side, and get the result that I want much faster uh, than putting 12 to 15 syringes of fillers in there. 
which can be pretty costly for one single area of the face. So be, beyond cost, I also use these red balloons to indicate recovery because with fat, people always say, well, there's a big recovery with fat. And I said, you're right, there is a big recovery with fat, but it's a one-time deal for seven to 10 days. What we forget is with fillers, we do it over and over and over again because most people, the reason they do fillers is because they can't afford a big fat transfer, so they want a little bit at a time. Well, that adds up to a lot of smaller recoveries and a lot of smaller costs that cumulatively could, not necessarily, could cost more and could lead to more total recovery periods. So just something to, re, just to di have dialogue with the patient so the patient can understand that. That's the only key of this. What fillers do I use? The two that I use the most, and it's, there's no financial affiliation uh, with these companies other than just, you know, obviously profit of using them when I'm in a, as a clinician. I like Juvederm and I like Artifil, but not everywhere. So what I do to break down the face is that I find no better product, and I strongly believe this in my hands, for the tear trough than Artifil. It may be an area that you're uncomfortable with, and certainly if you're just starting out, don't put Artifil under the eyes. You can't correct that if you make a mistake. So you've got to be very accurate. But I'm able to get right under the skin. I'll be lecturing on this next week in New Orleans. I have actually a full 15-minute lecture of just how I use PMMA. Um, in the temple, I'm actually liking Artifil a lot better, but Juvederm still works very, very well. Where I use Juvederm, because Artifil is so expensive as a product, is that I use Juvederm to b blend out the outer face. I'll show you some clinical examples in a moment, what I mean by blending out the outer face. But to me, this is, Juvederm is a great blender. It's not a great filler in terms of localizing. Like, I don't like it around the eyes. I think it's a terrible filler. I'll use Belotero um, as my first choice. Breslin as my second, if you don't have Belotero in this country when I'm dealing with uh, periorbital regions. If they don't want an Artifil product, I'll use that HA, uh, but not a big fan of Juvederm there. I love Juvederm for the mid-lower face and outer face. Fantastic product there. So let's go back to that model of youthful and older. Of course, it's a spectrum. What is youthful? Well, it's very arbitrary. It really depends on your chronologic aging more, sorry, your, your sort of your, your sun aging and your, your smoking history, all those things add more damage than just a number. If you're 35, you could look 50, and if you're 50, you could look 20. And those, those elements are a lot to do with your lifestyle, your genetics, etc. To break it down and make it easy is generally for the more youthful person. I mentioned I like fillers because it's less expensive, but also the other thing we talked about yesterday we don't think about is that fillers are bioinert. In other words, they're not necessarily going to change with aging. Fat is weight sensitive. And it's a thing that maybe in Europe when people are a little bit more static in their weight, it may be okay. But in terms of America, we have bad diets and we tend to change and fluctuate um, in our diet. I lost 50 pounds four years ago. So it's something that I fortunately maintained it. But if you have someone fluctuating a lot in weight, I tend to go with fillers and I tend to go with temporary fillers because I don't want to put too much of the permanent in and they go gain that weight and you have problems. So if they've lost the weight, certain areas that I know are not uh, as reflectively a problem with weight such as around the eyes, I may use Artifil. And then for areas like in the buccal area, I certainly don't want them to lose 50 pounds, put in a bucket of Artifil into the buccal area and then all of a sudden they gain 50 pounds, then I can't fix it. So these are things that are part of that dialogue with patients is we don't think oftentimes about long-term safety but it's so important to have that discussion with the patient and get the history from them. To me, the single most important thing I'm looking at is weight. And the single determinant, just like when you do a hair transplant on a 20 year old, you know how they're gonna age over 40 years. Same problem when I'm dealing with a lot of long lasting fillers such as fat or artifil when I'm dealing with a 20 year old may not be the best option for them. And that's a discussion you have to have with them very, very carefully. Let's talk about the next model that I really like to use, which is the face like a bed. To me, it's a very easy, easy model to describe to a patient, and I use this almost every day, to have them understand what are the pros and cons. So let's break it down. A bed has three components. Sheets, for the sake of argument, the duvet is going to rest under the sheets, and then a mattress below. The fat is the mattress. When I do a fat grafting, it changes in like Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, your blink. In a blink of an eye, someone sees you, they go, God, you look great. And if you look at my before and afters with your right brain, you'll say, wow, they look prettier. But if you use your left brain, which is the analytical mathematical brain, you may say, well, I don't know if they look a lot better. 
Uh, Jamal's lecture is about aesthetics. And it's not just about looking at where the nose bridges, et cetera. It's about understanding the total beauty of something. And so that's where fat grafting comes into play. It makes a face look much more attractive, much more youthful, much more beautiful, but it's a deep fill and fat is soft. So fat has certain problems. One, it's a graft, not 100% take. Number two is the fact that it's soft. It's not gonna fill a smile line, a nasolabial groove perfectly. If you wanna go in there and just target that, you're gonna have a failure. It's not gonna necessarily eliminate with perfection a, a, a orbital rim. It's placed deeply, a third problem. It should not be placed right under the skin, unlike maybe Artifil, um, or maybe Juvederm around the lower face, not around the upper face. But that causes a problem because it's farther from the target zone, it's way down deep. So if the filler is placed far away from the target, you're not gonna get the result as closely. So fat is a beautiful foundation for the face, but it doesn't fix all the problems that occur closer to the skin. I need things to build a face from the ground up like we're building a house, which will be our next analogy. The duvet is gonna be all the you know, rough and tumble areas that look bad, and that's gonna be a filler. If someone's got a little fold, a little marionette line, a little pre-jowl, I'm gonna go and fix those little areas toward nine months to a year after a fat graft as the fat matures. Again, that's a comment we talked about yesterday. Or I'm gonna go in there, and if they're gonna just do fillers, I'm gonna use fillers to target these little areas. If they come in and say, Dr. Lamb, I have these three little problems, they're not getting fat. That's, fat is not gonna work they're gonna get a filler. If they say, look, I'm really looking tired and older and I just don't know what I'm gonna do, and they have a lot of volume loss, especially to the mid face and outer face, they're, they're gonna be offered fat and at least counsel on fat. So I'll help guide a patient toward the good result. The sheets are gonna be the surface of the skin. Filler is not gonna make a surface wrinkle completely go away. You need neurotoxins for neuro, neuromodulators. You need lasers, you need, you need dermabrasion if you still do that. I use fractionated CO2 now, but you need good skincare products. You need the surface damage, the sheets, are not gonna be managed well with fillers. They're gonna be better managed with some kind of modulation. For me, it's chemo denervation or Botox or Dysport, et cetera, um, and laser skincare. Let's talk about the last model. Last model is building a house on sand. What does that mean? What that means using a clinical evaluation is putting a lot of temporary fillers in and then trying to do fat on it. I hate doing that. Because the temporary fillers, everyone says, oh, it lasts what? Three to nine months, six to nine months, nine months to a year. I don't believe so. I believe it lasts six weeks to forever, even a temporary filler. I've, I've, I've filled under the eyes and six years later, I still see the Juvederm there or the Restylane there or whatever I filled. So I, I don't think that's the case. And so when you're dealing with putting fat on top of a lot of temporary fillers, you deal with two problems. One is you don't know when that temporary filler is going away. Now you're putting this permanent structure on top of it. It's not as elegant. So if someone's got a couple syringes, fat is okay. Or if they've done temporary fillers and they come back to me two or three years later and it's all gone, fat is a great option. But when they come to me six months later and I've put 12 syringes of Restylane or Belotero or Juvederm in and they said, let's do fat, I'm not as keen to do it because it's like that sand is that shifting sand, that foundation that's falling away and putting this permanent filler on. Now, fat on top of fat is great. I don't do much of it anymore because I really realized as I was explaining to you the limitations of fat. I don't think it takes care of everything. If you start using fat to take care of all volume, I think you'll fail. If you're trying to take care of the tear trough to perfection, you either, you'll have two problems, under hitting it or over hitting it, right? You can easily overfill a tear trough. You can underfill a tear trough. You can exhaust a patient. You can exhaust yourself. And if you don't understand the limitations of fat, if you don't understand the limitations of fillers, you will have an exhausting career and you'll have exhausted patients. And so my goal is to really educate you about those limitations. And I try to help my colleagues as much as I help my patients. So do I like temporary fillers on fat? Yeah, that's okay with me, that's easy. Someone says, look, you know, in a year, I got a few things, I can't afford to do a lot of artifil, maybe I just need a little bit of Juvederm or Restylane. Okay, that's fine. That's easy to do because I'm just topping off that water there. Uh, topping off that glass of water to sort of mix a metaphor here. And permanent fillers on fat is my favorite thing. I just love putting a couple syringes because permanent fillers are expensive and it's great to go back and just touch it up with a couple syringes, very easy to do. I love doing that. So that works to me really, really well. Fat on top of the permanent fillers, in general, I don't like it. It's not house on sand, it's solid foundation. 
But because permanent fillers can be quite costly, and to get a face that really measurably looks better, which we'll show you a couple examples, for me it takes a lot of syringes. And if they already spent eight to twelve thousand on permanent fillers, and they say, "Hey, Dr. Lamb, I'm ready for fat now," what is the problem with that? Two problems: one, cost. Not going to spend a lot, a few more thousand on fat. In addition to that, because fat is inaccurate. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a deep foundation fill. They've already got this accurate permanent filler. Now I got to go back and put this inaccurate fat on top. Doesn't make too much sense to me. Fat should be the first foundation work for a face if you have a choice. And this is these comments are really really important. You understand this. Um, so here's another schematic of understanding how fat for me is a foundation, but it doesn't stop aging. And so every year down the road, you'll need a little bit of filler, and that's something people need to prepare themselves for. Because if they say, "Look, I want a perfect result for many years," you can, fat will still do it for you—a very good result, not a perfect, but a very good result. But you're going to lose some over time. So remember, it is important to consider uh, starting with fat or fillers, and then un having the patient understand they will continue to age. I emphasize that in every initial consultation. In every subsequent consultation or discussion with a patient, so hopefully these three paradigms or models of the face like a glass of water or aging like a glass of water, face like a bed and a house on sand are good methods that you could use to incorporate in your dialogue with a potential patient or an established one. Here's the example of a lady at 35 years of age that I did about 15 syringes of filler. She's now gone on to more. The, the one inconsistent element is she does have a little bit better hair here. But you can see that I filled every element of her, and if you really understand this, I've hit every element, especially in the temple. The scalloping that goes here to here is is improved. So you ovalize the face. So widening the face does not mean making it look fat; means making it balanced. And where do I put the fillers? Everywhere: her temple, her brow, her upper eyelid, her lower eyelid, her anterior cheek, her outer cheek, her subzygomatic zone, her buccal area, her outer buccal recess, her anterior chin, her, pre, her canine fossa. Nasal labial group, her, uh, and I fixed her lips. Actually, this is a good idea of balance. We talked a little about balance. I love that example of the circles. I want to borrow that from you. But if you look, look at these lips. First of all, they're poorly designed, but they stand out because they don't match the face. And this is a huge problem. Is I have people coming and want to do lip augmentation, and their face is not being rejuvenated. So their faces, their lips look crazy. So what I did here is I actually added a little bit more to the bottom lip to match out the top lip, which I still think is ugly. But her, it, does, it doesn't bother your eye as much. Because it doesn't look weird to you anymore. This is, believe it or not, 35 syringes, mainly with Artifil, done over seven years. Same lighting, believe it or not, in the same room, same camera, makeup on both, better hair on the right. I apologize, but light strikes the face differently. If you heard my talk yesterday, so she looks younger because she doesn't look like a skeleton. You, there are fewer transition zones. But I want you to see that in this photograph, that I hit every, and I did her lips. But if you look. The lips now match, and if you see that scalloping across the whole area, it looks balanced. What do you see walking around town? These cheeks on that face doesn't match. Looks absurd. This is why I want you to understand. Again, I filled every sub millimeter of her face, and that's what makes a face look better. Because aging is the lie is it's in your smile lines. The lie is that it's out somewhere else. It's everywhere. This is an example of a lady just after fat grafting. A lot better if you use that right brain, but there are little areas that are not perfect. So I came back with a couple of syringes, just touched her up a little bit further under the eyes or on the mouth, and softened it. So from beginning to end, you can see that fat by itself did 80% of the job, and the rest was done with fillers. Here's a lady. I'm sorry, she has a little more makeup on her eyes and the right. You can see that this is a good result if you use your right brain. It's not a good result if you use your analytical left brain. You say, "Well, wait, doc." I don't see this being that much better, and I don't see the teardrop being that much better. But if you look at her, she looks younger and a softer version of herself. And this is just touched up with a little uh, fillers, some artifil, and she looks better. And from beginning to end, you can see that cumulative blink effect is established. So, just a little plug for the book. It is going out of print, just to let you know.、Uh, but this is a, a book on how to do fat. This is more the left brain mechanically. For me, what I wanted to emphasize to you is the right brain and seeing the large picture. So I leave you with the idea: is for a moment, take a step back from what you do, and really, really look at beauty and see the whole picture. So you can get results. I said yesterday that are chilihush gile. Merci.